19 Nocturne Boulevard. Nocturne Boulevard? Not far. When you hit Howard, hang a right. Howard meets Philip at a weird kind of angle. Then you cross James and Paul. You can't miss Nocturne. It's just past the automat. 19 Nocturne Boulevard. Your address for suspenseful stories of the speculative, strange, and supernatural. Tonight's episode is From Beyond with the Lovecraft Five. Yes, this is 19 Nocturne Boulevard. Won't you step inside? Did you have any trouble finding it? What do you mean, what kind of a place is it? Why, it's the scene of a tragic event. Can't you tell? after dinner to bring us all here. That was dinner. Even I can't say anything good about it. Food should be used as fuel. Nothing more. Nutritionally. Next, he'll be giving us the chemical notations. Buck up. We can't all be epicures like you, Charles. And this little walking tour has piqued my interest. I take it we have reached our destination, Herbert? Yes. This is the house of the late Crawford Tillingast. Late lamented. Hmm. Doubtful. We'd better get inside rather quickly, though. Don't want the police to find us here. Really? Tillinghast died under rather mysterious circumstances. A friend of yours? I might have recognized him if I met him on the street. Might not. But he was a fellow scientist of a sort. There should be no danger now. Danger? But the power should probably remain off. So I brought along a couple of electric torches. But don't turn them on until we're inside, just in case. You said danger? To be precise, I said no danger. The machine that caused all the trouble is supposed to have been disabled, according to the only witness. And people have been in and out of the place. I say people, but I mean police, for days, without event. Ah, so there's a witness? Another acquaintance, someone I know rather better. Neither of them is really in my field. I work more in biology and chemistry. But we have spoken from time to time when mutual interests converged. Are we going to go inside or stand on the porch all day like milk bottles? Most doors are fairly easy to... Aha! If science doesn't pay, Herbert, you can always turn to crime. Aren't the neighbors likely to notice? The yard is large and the hedges are overgrown. Well, what's the worst that can happen, eh? A criminal prosecution? Add spice to a reputation. Go on, Herbert, we're right behind you. We need to go on through and up to the attic. There are likely stairs that go up from the kitchen. Many old houses had them, depending on the prevalence of servants in the household. Oh? The servants, you see, would sleep in the attic, and the masters didn't want them traipsing up and down the main hallways at all hours of the night. That's all very well, and Tillinghast did have servants. But I have a reason for wanting to go through the front hall. Something the witness mentioned that I wanted to observe for myself. Does he have a name? He... Who? Your witness. You can hardly call him the witness all night long. Take my word. Nameless characters are much more difficult to sympathize with. He asked that I not mention... We'll give him a name, then. Something to call him for convenience. And personalization. You expect me to come up with something? Oh, this is one of my areas. How about... Wilbur? Philip? Howard? Howard should be easy enough to remember. Shall we continue? Do we get the grand tour? You said there was a reason for us to go through the front hall? Yes, as I said, Howard is a fellow scientist. He was a friend, rather unfortunately, to the owner of this house, one Crawford Tillinghast. The late one? And you say he was a scientist as well? Of a sort. Some people really should never take up science. Half the time you can't get anyone to pay attention to your work. And when they do... They can't offer a better opinion than to insist that you're mad. Personal experience? Of course. 
but just as often it has nothing to do with the validity of your theories. It's merely a mind game. A well-placed blow to a scientist's ego can shatter him, send him completely to pieces, leaving the way clear for lesser men to step in and claim victory. Goodness! Or there's always the besmear campaign that Edison waged against Tesla. Good for you, Herbert. Never thought you had that kind of fire in ya. Remind me never to criticize anything scientific around him. Does all this apply to the story somehow? The story? Oh, yes, the story. Well, <clears throat> Crawford and Howard didn't work together. Their expertise fell into very different categories, but they were friends. At least, they were until the day when Howard made the mistake. And I believe he had no ulterior motive, unlike some of criticizing Crawford's theories. Oh, boy. Crawford threw him out with a warning never to darken his door again. This door or the one in front? His metaphorical door. Sorry to be an annoyance, since you're just starting to warm up. But isn't there a better place for this yarn than standing around a dark, musty old, old kitchen? Of course. Come along. The parlor should be through here somewhere. The very parlor, where they sat and smoked and told their tales of science until that fateful day. Very likely. It's awfully dusty in here for a house left unoccupied a mere week. Didn't you say this Tillinghast fellow had servants? It is an awfully large house for one man. Thus speaketh the pot. He had servants. They've been absent for a while. Howard wasn't very clear on that. Hold up a minute. What's this? If you weren't in the way, I might be able to answer you. Too damn bad there's no proper lights. It's a woman's dress, just lying there. How odd. Confess, Herbert. Does your story involve panderers? White slavers? No. Such distractions have no place in a story of science. Is it damaged at all? Not as far as I can see, but I'm hardly the expert. Unless it's actually shredded and bloody, which this one most certainly is not. <laughs> one dress looks much like another to me. Well, aside, you high-minded gentleman. I'm quite used to poking about in people's personal belongings. I can't help but feel there's a wee bit of difference between your ancient Mesopotamian and your modern old maid. How odd. From a cursory examination, it appears that all the uh, <clears throat> internal garments are still arrayed uh, within. I may be a mere Tyro, but even I know no woman removes her clothes that way. It would be damn inconvenient. <clears throat> For the woman, I mean. <laughs> Think of all the rebuttoning. I thought you all wanted to sit. Of course. We're easily distracted by oddities. <laughs> and women's undergarments, apparently. You understand now why I couldn't provide any of the amenities we usually have on these story nights? Of course. Someone would have to carry the picnic hamper. Not the best accessory for breaking and entering. Does that heap of crinoline have something to do with your story? Well, technically it's evidence, but police have a tendency to ignore anything that they can't explain. Evidence? Really? Point of fact, one week ago there was an unexplained death in this house. Presumably not Howard, since he's the one who told you all about it. Of course not. It was Tillinghast. Howard was present. That's one reason he doesn't want his name bandied about. He doesn't want to get the police started up again. Did your friend kill Tillinghast? You'll have to weigh the facts and decide for yourself. All will become known, hmm? Yes. Howard was persona non grata in the house for several weeks before the night of his death for daring to question his line of research. Which was? You never did go into that. Experimenting with variations on light waves and their effects on perception, or something along those lines. Howard wasn't entirely clear in his description. Unclear? After witnessing, if not causing, a death? <laughs> Small wonder. He arrived that night to find the house much as it is now, seemingly unoccupied and without electricity. Even then? How odd. It was kept off by a logical decision, not due to any defect in the system. Howard had spent the intervening weeks since his fall into disfavor, keeping tabs on his erstwhile friend, 
by way of the butler. So there were servants? At least two. Howard mentioned the butler and some sort of housekeeper, and his surprise that they were not present to greet him when he arrived. Why did he come back? Killing gas that specifically sent for him. Howard assumed it was an attempt at reconciliation. But? He had been kept informed of growing obsession with a machine in the attic, some apparatus he was perfecting, to the exclusion of all else, eating little and sleeping even less. Up in the attic? Right up there? Of course. Mm, are we in any danger from this machine? I can't think why. Howard was shocked at the appearance of his friend. How he had changed. It had been some time, hadn't it? A mere ten weeks. But he had lost weight, grown rather sallow, and looked feverish. Classic signs of madness, at least in the better sorts of stories. And his hair had gone white. Really now, Herbert, you of all people, as a scientist, must know that is an old wives' tale. White at the roots. Of course, it isn't empirically possible for the current growth of hair to change color overnight. A touch of indigo can send it in the other direction. But shock can alter the follicles, and any growth from that point forward may be affected. So he had had some sort of a shock, but some time back to make the roots noticeable. Tillinghast was not the right type to be a scientist. He didn't have the mental fortitude necessary to face down the possible effects of his actions. Had he actually gone mad? Who can define madness? But he had come to some penultimate discovery. To this end, he had entreated Howard to pay him a visit, in order that he might share what he had achieved. <laughs> a bit of I told you so. Best served cold. What do we know of the world and the universe about us? We see things only as we are constructed to see them, and can gain no idea of their absolute nature. Perception is a hotly debated concept in art as well. Look at the work being done by the Surrealists. Or, oh, God forbid, Dada. That's not art. With five feeble senses, we pretend to comprehend the boundlessly complex cosmos, yet other beings with wider, stronger, or a different range of senses might not only see very differently the things we see, but might see and study whole worlds of matter and energy and life which lie close at hand, and yet can never be detected with the senses we have. I can't even imagine a sense I don't have. It's like trying to imagine a color you've never seen before, or trying to think around a corner. I have always believed that such strange, inaccessible worlds exist at our very elbows, and now I believe that I, I, I have found, found a way, way to break, break down, down the, the barriers. barriers. Howard says Tillingas seemed absolutely assured of his conclusions, and he feared for his friend's sanity. Why break down these barriers? Shouldn't he have considered that they may be present for a very good reason? Always assuming he has any sort of method behind his madness. It is the duty of any scientist to go beyond and figure out what may lay outside the current realm of the probable. But what if such an exploration sh should do great harm? Isn't it also the duty of any scientist to have a bit of accountability? Of course. But some risks must be taken. So, if someone created a devastating bomb, for instance, in the name of science... It wouldn't matter how many people it killed, the very act of being able to make it would justify the science involved? Of course. Well, it's just as well that we aren't here to discuss theoretical morality. Besides, this is just a story, isn't it? No, this really happened. Sorry, what I meant is, for us, this is merely a night's entertainment. Oh, of course. Tillinghast went on, in that awful, croaking, wasted voice. Howard's words? I am not joking. Within 24 hours, that machine near the table will generate waves acting on unrecognized sense organs that exist in us as atrophied or rudimentary vestiges. Science fiction, pure and simple. Not necessarily. Many organs remain in the body despite centuries of evolution having rendered them obsolete for whatever purpose they may have once had in primitive man. The appendix? As a simplistic example, yes. At some point in the distant past, it served a purpose. Now it's merely an accessory. Like footmen. Rather. Howard surmised that while Tillinghast had probably not forgiven him, he needed someone to talk to. And Howard was the most likely candidate. 
having been privy to some of his theories previously. And he arrived to find the place dark and empty. Well, he mentioned candles. More gothic yet. Why did Howard come anyway? Wasn't he worried about some kind of remonstrances? Intellectual curiosity and wanting to see how his friend fared. The handwriting in the summoning letter had been feeble and cramped. Even his ink had turned white. Hush. It would be too much. I, I would not dare. <sighs> Howard asked about the electricity and was told, in no uncertain terms, that it was off for a very definite reason, but was not informed what that reason might be yet. <laughs> I would not dare. <laughs> he led Howard up through the house to the attic, which was lit with a sickly, sinister violet light. But that electric light? It came from the machine that was at the center of all the controversy. Howard described it as detestable, but machines should really not be regarded so subjectively. There are plenty of machines that are detestable. Name one. Tammany Hall. <laughs> oh, very good, very good. Now, now, we all use machines that would have been thought terrible in years gone by. I would be lost without my typewriter, Richard takes the occasional photograph. Backgrounds for my paintings. Nothing I hate more than having to stand around on some windy heath, or God forbid some tourist-laden beauty spot just to capture a scene. I'm quite fond of my Victrola. Most of these would have been considered magic by ancient man, and either embraced or reviled, depending on the climate of the times. Perception is subjective. That's part of what makes science such a difficult field. Determine not to lose your thread, eh? <laughs> I would not dare. <laughs> the electrical system was out of the picture entirely. And yet some kind of power seemed to be in operation, since the machine was lit. The glow, ha, huh? yes, the glow. Uh, it's not electrical, not in any sense that you could understand, but, but you, you will see soon enough. Curiosity or not, I don't know that I would choose to remain alone in a big, dark, empty house with someone who sounded so ominous. That is the difference between the run of the normal folk and the scientist. The mind of the scientist puts knowledge even above... above... Self-preservation? I was looking more for subjective fear responses. I suspect that's why there are so many dead scientists. And so few old ones. Now, now, this is a lovely tale. Stop putting Herbert off. Tillinghast <laughs> seated Howard near the machine and turned it on. Now the sound began, indicating that it was running, and the light changed. From port to starboard? It had been a strange purplish color, but now it increased, then waned, and settled on a pale color or blend of colors that Howard was unable to adequately describe. What did I say? Colors. But isn't there a very definite and specific set of colors that exist in the spectrum? Any painter can tell you that. Yet there are shades and blendings that are particularly difficult to achieve or to reproduce. It all depends on the purity of your pigments. What we think of as normal light is absolutely pure when it comes to color. And yet, it is not the absence of hue. Just look at it through a prism. Do you know what that is? That is ultraviolet. <laughs> you thought ultraviolet was invisible, and so it is. But you can see that and many other invisible things now. Isn't ultraviolet at the far end of the spectrum? Her eyes aren't made for that. Precisely. Oh ho. Tillinghast claimed that the machine's function was to open up long dormant senses, to widen the perceptions, and make visible that which is normally completely unseen. So he claimed that in a few moments he could reverse eons and waken senses that might only exist in his imagination. Yes. Oh. It might equate, though only in an abstract way, with the change in art when perspective was discovered, or rather, quantified. What? If you look at ancient art from cave paintings up to medieval tapestries, there is no standard for perspective, no logical depth. With the Renaissance and Da Vinci, art began to develop systematically into the third dimension. What are you talking about? A revolutionary change in vision? Never mind. Listen to me! The waves from that thing are waking a thousand sleeping senses in us. I have seen the truth, and I intend to show it to you. <laughs> in fact, I think it's well past time to show you. Show? The machine. It's disabled, 
but you can see the room where everything occurred. Get some ambiance. Uh, background color. Perspective. You have heard of the pineal gland. I laughed at the shallow endocrinologist. Fellow dupe and fellow parvenu of the Freudian. <laughs> Come along. That gland is the great sense organ of organs I have found out. It is like sight in the end and transmits visual pictures to the brain. If you are normal, that is the way you ought to get most of it. I mean, get most of the evidence from beyond. Aha! The scene of the crime. Is there room for everyone? Just shove in. Go on. It's bigger inside. Howard said that once the machine got up to speed, he began to see things. I fancied myself in some vast incredible temple with innumerable black stone columns reaching up from a floor of damp slabs to a cloudy height beyond the range of vision. The picture was very vivid for a while, but gradually gave way to a more horrible conception, that of utter, absolute solitude in infinite, sightless, sa soundless space. Sounds like a bit of a poet. For a scientist. From the farthermost regions of remoteness, a sound softly glided into existence. It was infinitely faint, subtly vibrant, and unmistakably musical, but held a quality of surpassing wildness which made it feel like a delicate torture of my entire body. There are certain note progressions which are determined to cause odd feelings. Stravinsky's Rite of Spring incited a riot at its debut due to the effect of the wild discords upon the audience. When Howard spoke, though, the spell, and I use the term to mean a period of hallucination and not for any magical connotations, was broken. I should also mention that during this momentary lapse of concentration, Howard had drawn his revolver. Ah, yeah? That might be a little important later. I was looking over your machine here. It appears to be damaged. I already told you it was disabled. That is why we are in no danger. Unlike Howard. <laughs> Don't move! For in these rays, we are able to be seen as well as to see. I told you the servants left, but I didn't tell you how. It was that thick-witted housekeeper. She turned on the lights downstairs after I had warned her not to, and the wires picked up sympathetic vibrations. Downstairs? Oh. Oh, it must have been frightful. I could hear the screams all the way up here in spite of all I was seeing and hearing from another direction. And later, oh, it was, it was rather awful to find those empty heaps of clothes around the house. Those clothes? Mrs. Updike's clothes were close to the front hall switch. That's how I know that she did it. As if we're just taken out of them. Oh, it got them all. But so long as we don't move, we're fairly safe. Remember, we're dealing with a hideous world in which we are practically helpless. Keep still! Keep still. Keep still. In my terror, my mind again opened to the impressions coming from beyond. I felt huge, animate things brushing past me and walking or drifting through my supposedly solid body. Before you scoff, you have to understand that most of what we think of as solid matter is merely solid on a very crude level. Individual molecules are only loosely bound together. Is there going to be a test later? I thought I saw Tillinghast look at these things as though his better trained senses could catch them visually. <laughs> you see them? You see them? You see the things that float and flop about you and through you every moment of your life? Have I not succeeded in breaking down the barrier? Have I not shown you worlds that no other living men have seen? I don't think it's just barriers that were breaking down. As I said, some people are not meant for the hard discipline of science. But he says these things could harm them, could have some effect just because they, the scientists, could now see them? That's ridiculous. Like saying if someone is blind, he won't get hit by a motor car. No, if someone is blind, he gets hired as an art critic. You think those floundering things wiped out the servants? Fool! They are harmless. But the servants are gone, aren't they? Maybe they took a new position in a house with the power laid on. The clothes, though. You, you tried to stop me. You discouraged me when I needed every drop of encouragement I could get. You were afraid of the cosmic truth, you damn coward! 
But now, now I've got you. This room would be a little small for a tete-a-tete with a raving lunatic. Particularly one who insisted that if you move a muscle, something terrible might grab you from behind. Rather like posing for one of your portraits. That's why I don't include people. What swept up the servants? What made them scream so loud? Don't know, huh? <laughs> You'll know soon enough. <laughs> Isn't it a bit warm in here? We're almost finished. I promised Howard I would look for something at the other end of the attic. Taking the torch? I can hardly search in the dark. Besides, you have the other one. The oddest part is how Killingas somehow shifted his focus from things immediately surrounding us to things far beyond. I have seen beyond the bounds of infinity and drawn down demons from the stars. Space belongs to me, do you hear? Things are hunting me now. Things that devour and dissolve, but I know how to elude them. It is you they will get as they got the servants. Stirring, dear sir? If you had moved, they would have been at you long ago. These things were never still, but seemed ever floating about with some malignant purpose. Sometimes they appear to devour one another, the attacker launching itself at its victim and instantaneously obliterating the latter from sight. Shuddering, I felt that I knew what had obliterated the unfortunate servants. Don't worry, they won't hurt you. They didn't hurt the servants. It was the seeing that made the poor devil scream so. Oh, my pets are not pretty, for they come out of places where aesthetic standards are. Oh, very different. Very different. Hollywood? I'm going to check downstairs. Be right back. Foremost among the living objects were inky jellyfish monstrosities, which flabbily quivered in harmony with the vibrations from the machine. I always knew you were no scientist. Trembling, huh? Trembling with anxiety to see the ultimate things I have discovered? I saw to my horror that they overlapped, that they were semi-fluid and capable of passing through one another and through what we know as solids. Why don't you move then? Tired? Well, don't worry, my friend, for they are coming. Look! Look! Curse you, look! It's just over your left shoulder. <laughs> Ah. Well, turn the torch back on, Edward. I didn't. Funny. Do you see that? Good God. I can't tell if it's actually... Barely there. This might be a time to shut the eyes. <clears throat> Why are you standing here in the dark? Flashlight died. Let's go downstairs. Did you find what you were looking for? No. Looks like the police confiscated everything of any interest. Except, uh, the machine. Ah, I almost forgot the end of the story. Yes. Yes. They burst in and found Howard with a recently fired gun standing over the prostrate body of his fellow scientist. As clear as a tableau in a wax museum. But he didn't shoot him. You said he's no longer under arrest. It wasn't until the police physician examined Killingas' body that they let him go. Was it one of the creatures that killed him? And maybe Howard shot it? I feel a painting coming on. The physician determined that Tillinghast had perished. Yes. Of apoplexy. Ah, the classics. But the gun. You saw what happened. Howard shot the machine. That's why it's broken like that. Too bad. Would have been interesting to examine. But it's not completely broken, is it? <laughs> yeah, that was a good one, Herbert. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha, uh, yep. Good job. Uh, how did you get it to do that, anyway? Do what? Now that you know how to find us... Don't be a stranger. We have at least five of those already. Tonight's episode, From Beyond, was adapted by Julie Hoverson 
from the story by H.P. Lovecraft. In tonight's show, Herbert was Carl Cubbage, Charles was Michael Coleman of Tales of the Extraordinary, Warren was Glenn Hallstrom, Richard was Philemon Vanderbeck, Tillingast was Jack Kincaid of Edict Zero FIS, and Howard was Russell Gold. Also tonight, introducing our new Edward, Matthias Rebney Morgan. Music for this episode was by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Cover art by Julie Hoverson. Scene preparation by Renan LeBeouf. Sound and mastering was done by Julie Hoverson. Sound effects were found on SoundSnap.com, Sonomic.com, StockMusic.com, OneSoundFX.com, and also through the footage firm and Blastwave FX. The opening theme was by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. The opening credits featured Cole Hornaday, Renaud LaBeouf, and Julie Hoverson. All persons, places, and events in this story were fictitious or used in a fictitious manner and are not meant to reflect any persons, places, or things, living, dead, or undead. Questions? Comments? We would love to hear from you. Contact us at 19nocturne at live.com, that's 19nocturne, or check out our website at www.19nocturneboulevard.com. Also, you can like us on Facebook. This presentation, as well as the scripts and characters therein, is copyright 2012 to Julie Hoverson and Reality Productions, and is released under a Creative Commons 3.0 Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Spread the show around, but don't try to make money off it. If you want to try something like to reenact an episode, just drop us a line. <laughs> oh, ha ha. Curiosity or not, I don't think that I would choose to remain alone in a dark, empty, mucking mint. Oh, God, there's not a homoerotic joke in there, one, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can give that a slightly different reading. Curiosity or not, I don't know that I would choose to remain alone in a dark, big fuck. I can't even imagine since I don't have them. No, I don't have because I have 20 of them. <laughs> <laughs>